Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Eating at a Meeting. It is now September 7th. Holy moly, we're into, into September. Um, I am in Columbus, Ohio, and I got out of the car today, and I'm like, oh, it's football weather. And I am in Ohio State ground in city. I'm not going to football game. But I am here to speak for the MPI chapter of Ohio on Friday. But before we get to that, we actually are here today for the podcast episode. And I am here with Jennifer Squelia, did I say that right? Mm -hmm. um, who is the owner of L RLC Events. And I read a magazine article that you wrote for pre or were interviewed for with Preview Magazine a couple of months ago. And I'm like, oh, got to have her on here to talk about food and beverage. So hi, Jennifer. Hi, Tracy. I am so honored to be here. Um, I'm a big fan of yours. I think you do amazing you. things for our industry and especially when it comes to food and beverage education. So oh, um, thank you so super, much. Super I appreciate happy to that. be here. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Well, in your article, and I'm putting that topic back up here, is the importance of shared meals at events. And it was really, I really loved that because a lot of times we're just shuffling people in and out from our things and we don't really value what we're what we're doing at that event and and or we're just checking boxes off saying I want this today and this tomorrow right mm -hmm. so can you talk a little bit about what why you feel the importance of a shared meal yeah you know i think the importance of a shared meal really accelerated or really came to light you know post pandemic mm -hmm. yeah I, listen I'm grateful for Zoom. We were able to stay connected. It, it, it gave us a platform to stay connected. But, you know, we we all know that nothing beats human connection. But I think one thing that Zoom couldn't replicate was that magic moment at the coffee break mm -hmm. station or right. sitting around a table, you know, at a meeting. So I feel like sharing that meal is, is something we couldn't replicate in right. a virtual setting. Even when people did really creative culinary classes and all that, it's just not the same. You're still in a room by yourself, right, on a camera. Um, so I think coming back to in-person events, even I've seen it, you know, in the meetings I planned, people really enjoy that time to talk to each other over a meal. Right. Food brings us together, you know, and it's a it's a subject matter that's easy for people to talk about, like, oh, look at this cool, you know, piece of chicken. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, um, but I, you know, I think it brings people together and it's a, it's a uniter um, and it creates connection and it's something, it's a really easy way to start a conversation. Oh my goodness, the salad is delicious or something like that, you know, and um, during a break, you know, when you, you basically in Zoom, you turn off your camera and go get a glass of water or whatever. And now, you know, during a break, you go grab a cup of coffee and there's someone standing there and it's like, you have, you just strike up a conversation. Um, mm -hmm. It's those magic moments I think we really missed uh, when yeah. we had, you know, the and, and and breaking bread together, sitting around a table, sharing mm -hmm. a meal, such a basic human connection win, you know, for yeah. so many levels. I, I wholeheartedly agree. And just, you know, or like I said, I flew on a plane this morning before I got here and the guy's like, I had a banana. He's like, you got another banana. Right. And and he pulled out a can of sardines. And I said, you are not opening them on this plane because you will be the worst seatmate ever on a plane. Oh, my and gosh. He, and he's like, no, I'm like, I'm, I'm going to get up and move. And he's like, I'll wait till I get to my hotel room. I'm like, thank God. Um, but, you know, just that was just over food. Right. On a plane. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So it really does, you know, add some vibrancy and stuff to the, to a conversation. And, and it does actually make it easy to talk to somebody when yeah. you're, when you're sharing that meal. Um, so what, one of the questions that I, I think was part of that article too, was the silver linings of COVID and people are, I'm sure a lot of people are hesitant to say there's any silver linings from this, but what do you think? There are silver linings. What are the silver linings? And are, do any of them revolve around food and beverage? Yeah, I, I think so. I think, you know, yes, COVID obviously brought so much, you know, hardship to so many people and mm -hmm. it, it broke a lot of hearts and it was just really devastating. There's no question about it. And I certainly don't mean to make light of that uh, when I say there are silver linings, but I truly am a, I'm a glass half full kind of gal. And I really believe uh, in my heart of hearts that there's always something to be grateful for. And I feel like during COVID, um, the 
essence of human connection. I don't think we're ever going to take that for granted again. At least I hope mm -hmm. not. Um, and I do feel like coming out as we learn to live with COVID and we're driving forward with in-person events, I really feel like that in-person connection, that human connection is something that you can just tell, you know, as I go back in meetings and I can tell my attendees are just so happy, even if yeah. they're wearing a mask or whatever, uh, they are happy to be back in person. It's definitely something we really, really missed. I also think that um, it accelerated flexible working conditions. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of very conservative companies that would not allow people to work from home at all, mm -hmm. not even a day. And so I think with COVID, I think people realized, wow, you know, it is working. People are mm -hmm. working from home. And although I really feel like it's important to be in the office one or two days a week or whatever people choose to do, I think it's nice that we have um, more flexible working conditions, you know, people with kids or, you know, right. taking care of aging parents or whatever it is. It's, you know, nice to be able to have a couple days at home. And I think people realize, I think companies realize people do work when they're home. It's like, yeah, you know, and you and I have been um, on our own, I think in our own businesses for a while. And mm -hmm. I've been working remotely for over 15 years. And, you know, I remember when I first did it, people were like, oh, do you watch TV when you're working? And I'm like, <laughs> No, yeah. I work harder at home, I think, in my home office than I ever did in an office environment. So anyway, so I do think that's been a big silver lining is it's allowed the flexible working conditions to kind of right. be a lot more accepted, gives people a little bit more flexibility. Um, when it yeah. comes, go ahead, sorry. No, no, I, I agree with that. And it, it is, it does make a difference. It's it's a little bit challenging in some respects, but I do miss the water cooler conversations oh, a yeah. lot of times. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I feel like people will find their place. Right. Um, right. I think it's a generational thing, too. Right. I think the um, people just coming right out of college, they're so smart and so successful. But I think they may they don't have the experience of that water cooler talk. So mm -hmm. um, hopefully they'll you know, and they I think their pre preference is to work more remotely, which is I respect that viewpoint. Um, Actually, but my niece is. So I didn't mean to interrupt you. My no, niece is starting no. a job on Monday and um, up in Washington, D.C. And she's like, I'm looking forward to the hybrid. She's only yeah. going to go stay at home two days a week. But she's moving to a whole new town and she wants the camaraderie and that Good. water cooler conversation. So she can, you know, she actually had an experience over the summer where it was 100 percent remote. She never met her boss. And it was crazy. kind of hard. Mm hmm. Yeah. When you think about that, I, I I really feel for the last three years, people have started a job like remotely. That's mm -hmm. kind of really, I mean, back right. I, I don't want to date myself too much. When I started my career, you know, over 30, 35 years ago or whatever, I, it was so like being at work and being in my early twenties, it was part of your social life. I mean, it was really mm -hmm. such a big part of your life. So it's really right. good. I think that that hybrid environment or to, to really, in, you know, connect with the people you work with. Cause you tend right. to, especially in our industry, right. You, uh, in the hospitality industry across the board, we mm -hmm. we're a bunch of extroverts. We're, we're fun. We're cool to hang out with. <laughs> we are, we are. <laughs> so let's do it. Let's take advantage of that. So I think it's, I think it's important. Yeah. Now, did you have a silver lining related to food and beverage? Well, yeah, I think, I think again, I kind of stated it earlier in the podcast, but I think we all missed breaking bread. And again, I don't think that coming together for a shared uh, food and beverage experience will, I think is definitely going to be something that we'll never take for granted again. Yeah. So, yeah, I hope so. Yeah. I mean, cause I, I think, I hope that food becomes more important and, and, and I've been saying this for a while now. I mean, it's our number one expenditure, but we spend the least amount of time on. Mm -hmm. And I hope that we start to switch that a little bit and, or a lot, I would really like more focus to be on the food and beverage and what we're serving. And, and especially out of coming out of COVID too, you know, with the weight, the wastefulness that we have in food and beverage, can we start to seeing everybody who went hungry during COVID yeah. and can we do yeah. a lot more with that? So, yeah, yeah, um, definitely. I also, don't you think though, Tracy, I mean, I hear you, you know, I really feel that we've come a long way in like the last five to 10 years when it comes to food and beverage at events and, Working, I think the culinary teams at all the venues and hotels and restaurants that I have the great fortune to work with, they've really stepped up to create 
you know, obviously great food, but also great right. experiences, you know, whether it's food stations and like a lot, I see there's a lot more action stations now. People mm -hmm. love seeing the chef like put together their taco, you know? Yeah. Um, so I definitely think we've come a long way um, yeah. and not just checking the box. Um, and I also think our attendees are also a lot more educated on food. Think about like, you know, 20, 10, 20 years ago, how oh many food God. networks were there? None. Yeah, yeah exactly. Now there's like, yeah so many and there's so many mm -hmm. awesome shows about food and you know what anthony bourdain did with you know mm -hmm. uh, kitchen confidential i mean that kind of started a whole new era mm -hmm. about kind of the behind the curtain of food and beverage and also just people's knowledge of food right. and beverage well and my friend sophia was actually on um Bree's, um bargain bargain meals at home and she's an event planner and um, she was just on that show and they had to actually, it was ironic because she's an event planner, but they had to create an event food. They had 30 minutes to create a menu for an event with just what they had in their in the refrigerator on a bargain thing. And they okay. could only go to the grocery store one time and do two different parties. Um, wow. So it was, so I think even that looking at that, how can you be more budget conscious, you know, with yep. your, at home, but also, you know, at events, you know, working with those chefs on yeah. doing that. And I think a lot of that does come from, um, from television. And actually I saw an article the other day is like what TikTok is bringing back the side table yeah. dem food demonstrations. Yeah. Yeah. Which I was like, that's kind of fun. I know. TikTok. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I'm not on that. It's, I just, it's now a verb. No, yeah. neither am I, but it's like TikToking or, you know, right. it's, it's really amazing how, how cool it is though. And how many cool, you know, I ever, mm -hmm. I'll watch like videos on TikTok. I mean, it really is. It's changed how we yes. use social media in so many ways and a lot. And I think in a lot of good ways, a lot of good things come out on TikTok too. Yes, they do. They do. So you're also the chair of financial insurance conference professionals. Is that right? Yes. Say, That's correct. Okay. FICP. Great. Yep. FICP. Yep. Um, sorry. My niece decided to FaceTime me and it popped up on my screen. Um, <laughs> <Well> good. <laughs> Hello, niece. Um, hi. <laughs> um, so can you tell us about, I mean, it's a great organization, the great conferences. Yes. I've spoken at a couple of them. And what is that, um, what are you planning to do, adapt and, and execute with FICP and food and beverage? Because this is an insurance and financial planners and Right. That's a whole, you've got a lot of incentive trips in that organization. Yes. Yep. Yep. Definitely. It's, you know, I've been a member of FICP since 2000 uh, and it's such an honor to be on the board and especially chair. Um, it's really a awesome, awesome association. It's, it's a great community. So yes, yeah, so we, it, the members of FICP are meetings professionals within the financial insurance industries. And then we also have hospitality partners who are part of our community as well from all walks of the hospitality partner community, obviously hotels, DMCs, speakers, um, all sorts of cool stuff. Right. So, mm -hmm. and it really is an amazing community and it's kind of a niche community. I mean, mm -hmm. um, and so we've, I think the pandemic has been, you know, obviously for everybody. Right. But we've right. made a lot of changes. We've, we've, uh, we have a great year round virtual offering now that again, that the pandemic kind of accelerated that, but we went our, and we our annual conference obviously missed it in 2020. It's in November. Typically mm -hmm. um, we did it virtually, but we were able to come back last year in 21. Okay. We were in Phoenix and this year we're going to be in Boston. Um, at the nice. end It's going to be really amazing. But from a food and beverage perspective, I think, we always try to do, because you're planning for planners, right? So you're always trying to showcase um, things that are new and exciting. And our hospitality partners and our sponsors who present all this stuff just really are awesome. They do so many cool, creative things. Mm -hmm. So I think I always learn a lot with the FICP annual because we're open, like as meetings professionals, we're open to trying and seeing new things. So our, right. you know, our audience is really kind of craves it and they do and they deliver every single time. So I think, you know, that food and beverage experience is so critical to every, you know, all the in-person events that we do and people really mm -hmm. do focus on it and they learn a lot from it. So um, it's a, it's a really, I think our education is best in class. Networking opportunities are mm -hmm. amazing. Um, and I'm just really proud to be part of the community. 
Well, that's good. And it is, it's been a good program. And have you seen, I, not to get into the nitty gritty of, of FICP, but hopefully those members are coming back and yes. you know, they're starting yep. to get to, to do their events again, because a lot of it is incentive yes. um, travel meetings as well. Yep. Yes. And they are, we are, we're definitely coming. You, we hear from our members, they're busier than ever. And as you know, mm-hmm. you know, everything's been kind of kicked to kicked forward, kicked forward. So I think everyone's, um, you know, two years of events are now happening and, you know, they're all being kind of, so people, people, I think our planners are busier than ever for Q, you know, for the rest of this year and obviously beyond. So it's, it's really, the compression is interesting. Um, People Mm -hmm. are really busy and there has been, you know, a lot of changes in our industry, especially on the hospitality partner side, you know, they really Mm -hmm. were uh, just devastated. And, um, but One thing I will say throughout the pandemic is the resiliency Mm -hmm. um, and the positive attitude displayed by our community really was very inspiring to me. I agree. And there's so many new adventures for people in new jobs. um, And, you know, there's some people who chose to leave the industry, which is unfortunate, but I think there's a lots of opportunity. I actually got an email today from a young girl who just started, um, in the tourism and events department at NC State, she's like, "I'm the event chair for our, or, for our organization. Can you come speak on Monday?" I'm like, "Sure." Oh, so awesome. she's excited to get. I'm like, "Oh, I'm definitely going to come talk to you know students who are wanting to get into this industry because there are so many different opportunities." Yeah, I think giving yeah. back mm-hmm. kind of is so critical. And I, I, anytime like people, you know, as an event professional, people call, Hey, you know, I have a daughter or a neighbor or blah, blah, you know, that really interested in getting into events. And you talk to her, my answer is always yes. Mm-hmm. I think it's really important yeah. that we kind of provide the platform and the, you know, mentorship. I it's, I believe in it wholeheartedly in this industry because it is a great industry and it has it, been disrupted in the last couple of years, but it is roaring back and there's yes. so much opportunity. Exactly. Yeah. So how do you, okay, coming, we're, we're still kind of in an uncertainty in a lot of respects. I mean, I actually yeah, saw an article the other day that said um, the U.S. Labor Department is saying chefs are needed. They're, like there's chefs that have left the industry, have left chefing restaurant-wise, hotel-wise because of the hours and things like that. And yep. I actually met one who's executive sous chef left sous chef left to go build houses because he actually had more time with his family doing that right yeah and he did and the chef didn't blame him right right but so how do you in this time of uncertainty when we don't know if the food and beverage is being prepared in-house or if it's being catered from outside or you know how many attendees are going to come how do you what are some steps that you have or some tools in your toolbox to help manage an uncertainty. Yeah, no, it is. It's an interesting time for sure. And I think two, two things that come to my mind, first of all, is we talked a little bit about this before we went live is just showing grace. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the pandemic shut things down very quickly, but the, the reopening, turning that light switch back on is obviously it's not, it's just not that simple, right? You have to ramp up, you have to retrain, you have to kind of, get people. And so I think as a meetings professional, when you're going in, you can't just say, you know, that, you know, why, why doesn't this happen this way or what have you, you know? Mm-hmm. So I think the site that leads to communication. And I really feel it's important to communicate. I think uh, not only cu- the culinary teams, but like our the people who the conference housemen who set up the, all the oh, meeting yeah. rooms while we're mm-hmm. all sleeping, they're amazing. The kitchen stewards who make sure all those, Chafing dishes are shiny and clean and all the everything you need is out there and ready to go. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's 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 all over our industry. And I think for me, I'll say, okay, tell me about your staffing levels. How are you doing? What can I do? Like what I want your chef and your team to do something that they feel comfortable delivering as much as, you know, I I don't want to like we don't need a trapeze artist, you know, serving champagne cocktails. We let's right. stick to the, you know, like we talked about before, I think people are um, really savoring that human connection. So mm-hmm. it's, I think the setting we create, the food that we put on the table is really important part of that, but it's for them, it's like, it's about being together, right? So we obviously mm-hmm. want a great food and beverage experience. We want a great experience all in, but I think we really have to work closely with our hospitality partners 
across the board, speaker bureaus, DMCs, hotels, whoever we're working with, whoever we're partnering with on the events is tell me a little bit about your challenges. What can we do? You know, for an example, like in-room amenities, you know, Mm -hmm. that's a big part of, you know, incentive programs in particular, right? Doing those wonderful room drops. Well, you've got a thousand people. Maybe that's really hard for the hotel to do right now. So maybe you rethink Mm -hmm. it. So I just think we have to show grace and really communicate and say, you know, what I would love to do, you know, a filet mignon, is it easier to kind of roast tenderloins and slice it up or grill the filet? I mean, right. what's, what works for you with considering the challenge that you, challenges that you're facing? Because at the end of the day, we all want the same thing, right? right? Everybody does. We want a safe, healthy, enjoyable event for all. And we want the, the hotel wants to succeed even right. more than we do. So yeah, it's a no, I, kind of approaching yeah. it as a partnership. I like that. And I'm hoping that, you know, because we've you've always seen in this in the media, you know, it's the buyer's market, it's a seller's market, and that not just for hotel or not just yeah. for houses, it's right. for meeting space, right? Yeah. And I hope we come out of this more as that partnership and it's not totally. that yeah. Because yeah, it's it, trying to find spaces is and people is hard right now. Yeah, it is. And I think we really have to show grace and understanding. Mm -hmm. Obviously, some markets have been more impacted than others, too. So Mm -hmm. I think it's a matter of us doing our research, you know, to make sure that. um, But I I think it's just really about. I think we all want, you know, we all have high standards. We want the best thing. But we also Mm -hmm. have to say, all right, maybe it was up here, but maybe we need to come down just a little bit at the end Mm -hmm. of the day. Will it impact the attendees? As you know, I think half the stuff we do, they don't even know. Like, there's so many things that have happened at events, right? But pre COVID, Mm -hmm. that just was totally flipped everything on its ear. But from the attendee experience, they had no idea. Right. So we have to remember that, right? (laughs) Yep. Yeah. And that's it's my one saying is that we always pull bigger rabbits out of smaller hats every year, but they don't (laughs) know that we did that. Right. right? And do we really need to do that? And Mm -hmm. so I I like the idea of rethinking, you know, can something be simple and be just as extravagant? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think we kind of have for now, as we start, you know, coming back in person and people are connecting, I think they're so happy just to be, you know, outside, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, meeting people, getting connect that human connection. I think we can simplify um, Mm -hmm. and it's a win-win. The attendees are happy and it makes things may be a little bit easier operationally for our wonderful partners who are helping right. us, but we, we can't be successful without them. So it's gotta be a partnership approach. I, I totally agree. Yeah. So I want to talk about a couple of the um, tips that you had in the preview article, because I thought they were really pertinent and people, um, you know, need to kind of really think about them when they're planning their food and beverage. Um, and it was some tips that you had on planning inclusive and creative culinary experiences. Can you give us a couple of those? Yeah, I think there's two two uh, approaches there. I think from the attendee perspective, when they present you with, you know, you obviously, I think we all, it's best practices to ask for dietary requests, you know, when people register to make sure that we accommodate. And I think it's really important to Take, I take those very, very seriously. And I'm not afraid to ask questions. If I'm not quite clear on what they mean by this, that, or the mm-hmm. other thing, I, I'll ask them, you know, tell me what it is. Like, I know what you can't eat, but what can you eat? You know what I mean? The, right. That, that I that love makes, that. Yeah. Right. So what do you like? What is it that, you know, I had a recently on a program, I had someone who, um, you know, was vegan, but she really loved peanut butter. So I worked with a culinary and we got her peanut butter and she's, you know, cause she, that's, that was like her favorite form of protein. So I think the key is, you know, really listening to, to your attendees Mm -hmm. and not being afraid to ask questions. That's part of it. I think the other, the other side of it is really working with your culinary team or your conference services team, whoever, you know, I, I love to have direct contact with the culinary team, but being really upfront with them about all the, um, be very clear when you're communicating, for example, someone may be gluten-free. Well, are they celiac gluten-free or are they just preferred gluten-free. Both are something to take very seriously, but obviously the celiac side of things is very, very serious. So you need to really, I think, be very clear to your culinary because it matters to them. They need to know Mm -hmm. which one it is, right? Right. Because it's uh, clearly one is more serious. Um, They're they're both, 
very valid, but one is definitely right. like life threatening, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, you know, that's I think to me, I think that's that clear communication. Um, and really when you're planning your menus, I also try it's that balance, right? Of making sure you're planning for your dietary, you know, mm -hmm. requests, but also not planning everything towards that. You also have, you know, your majority of people can will, will eat anything. So I think I think that is really important to make sure you balance that. Mm -hmm. And I also really like to work. I, I've seen a lot more of this and I'm sure you have too, Tracy, but I like to work with the culinary teams on stations that where it's almost like a build your own scenario. So right. rather than having like a street taco station with all the tacos pre-made, you have somebody there that can build it for you. So let's say you don't, you're allergic to mangoes, you right. know, people are, it's, mm -hmm. and then that way they can create a taco experience with no mango or what have you. Right. So I think, um, or trail mix, build your own trail mix. Some people mm -hmm. are allergic to nuts. They can put other things in there, you know? So yeah. I think I've seen a lot more of that too. And I try to incorporate that as much as possible in, um, in my, you know, buffet stations, breaks, yeah. you know, so people can kind of customize what they and, want. And and the customization, and I like that because I don't like to say special meals. I like to say personalized plates and, yeah. and that customization. And when you do those action stations, it does allow for that personalization for everybody. Yes. Not just for the people who exactly. have dietary restrictions. And I exactly. love that it levels the playing field for sure. Right. And I think, you know, again, it's back to that balance, right? You want to mm -hmm. obviously let these folks who have let you know they have dietary restrictions, take them. You, you I hear you. I mm -hmm. under, you know, cause I try to like, you know, I tend to, I mean, it's I think it's hard to do this when you have thousands of people at your events, but mine, I tend to do smaller ones. I always kind of make a note. And when they check in with me, Hey, I mm -hmm. saw that you put on your, that you're allergic to nuts. I just want to assure you that, you know, we're very aware of it. The culinary teams are aware of it. And if you have any hesitation, if you're not questioning what's in something, please, please let me know. Cause we obviously right. want to make sure you have a safe experience. So I think, you know, um, it's really important to, make, make special, you know, make them feel special, but at the same time, don't make them feel singled out. Right. You know, kind mm -hmm. of like what you were just saying. It's like, I love that, you know, uh, pref what did you just say about the, um, personalized? Pers yes. Love yes. that. Mm -hmm. Love that. Yeah. It's so yeah. great. Cause I, somebody said it and it was not referencing food, but it was like somebody who utilizes as a wheelchair user, right. He's my yeah. need is still to get there. It just means or my need is to eat. Everybody's need is to eat. We just eat yes. different ways. Right. Yeah. Yep. And I yep. thought that was a good way to think about it as well. Oh, that's right. So, I love that. Yeah. Great yeah. perspective. Awesome. Yeah. Cause in it, it's, we're not trying to be a burden, right? We just don't no. want to die. Right. Or they don't. <laughs> yeah. So no. And that's the other thing. I also think we've come a long way. Right. When I, mm -hmm. I knew when I was growing up, very few people had food allergies. It was kind right. of unusual. Now it's, um, you know, not everyone has one, but if there, there are a lot more out there. And so I think mm -hmm. we just need to, we want everyone to, it's in the sense of belonging and being included is so mm -hmm. critical across the board anywhere. Right. But especially at our events. So I think it's just super important to make sure that people are heard, right. feel, feel safe, feel included, yep. feel like they belong. It's so important. And, they, and doing that when you're sitting down to a meal, Yes. R really kind of, I think, enhances that even more. Yeah. Right. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Yep. Because you're not, uh, how many times have you sat there and watched somebody not have their meal? Right. It's the worst. It is. Yeah. yeah. And it comes, everybody's gotten, is done eating and you're still waiting for your meal. Yeah. Right. I also think um, our culinary, I, I just feel like culinaries, you know, our venues, hotels, all the people, the caterers, everyone who's mm -hmm. doing, they've gotten so much better at it. Mm -hmm. But I think the key is you have to give them the tools to be really good at it. You oh, that's a really, yeah. Sitting, right. Mm -hmm. This is where they're sitting. This is what they want, you know. And I also think the whole vegetarian, vegan, plant, plant-based mm -hmm. diets, it, they've come such a long way. It's not just a plate of vegetables anymore. It's, you know, it's like a grilled cauliflower steak with all this really cool stuff on it and um, tofu and all sorts of really like creative, interesting uh, meals and not just, mm -hmm. you know, oh, here's, here's some pasta with veggies on it. Oh, yeah. You know? That was typical. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's, it's gotten a lot better. It's really right. has. And I, I give a lot of credit to our industry. Mm -hmm. um, they've really stepped up. Yeah. I think we still have a ways to go, but I think everybody needs to 
yeah constantly change change is constant so oh, how can we constantly improve right it's yeah. and i think th those who are open to that will be very successful exactly yeah. Now, how do you, how are you incorporating healthy and nutrition food and beverage into your events? Because there's, you know, some people are like, oh, people go to events and they're just going to break their diets. But I think coming out of COVID, oh, yeah. people are really kind of focused on their health, you know, more so. Yes. So have you seen, what have you seen? What are you doing as it relates to that? Yeah, that's a really good point. And even like for me personally, I mean, you know, um, I, I, when I was traveling before, I'd be like, oh, great. I'll grab a bag of peanut M&Ms at the airport. And I really think twice, right, about my choices. Yeah. So I think it's really important that we provide healthy choices at all, in all aspects of the food and beverage experience. Um, and I, I think that um, for me, I tend to make sure that, like, for example, I'll do it by meal. For breakfast, I want to make sure that there's non-meat options. So if we're doing like a frittata or a burrito, just make sure there's ones without bacon or sausage or whatever. Mm -hmm. I, You know, something like an oatmeal or a quinoa or something that's more that will that's not egg based or what have you. I mm -hmm. always try to do something like that. Obviously, plenty of fruit. I also try to stay away from the danishes like, you know, I'll do like maybe breakfast breads and muffins. And although technically they're probably not that much healthier, I think the viewpoint is, you know, um, they're healthier than like a sticky bun. Um, right. I, I do try to um, put that type of variety into the, the breakfast menu for breaks. Um, again, you know, who doesn't love the jumbo chocolate chip cookie, but try to make sure we put and not just like whole fruit, but, you know, fruit kebabs or, you know, some trail mix, some nuts, raisins, dried fruit. I love it. I'm one of my favorites is like build your own trail mix type of yeah. scenario. And then you can make it as healthy or unhealthy as you want. Um, and then for lunches, you know, especially if we have an afternoon session, I really try not to do a lot of carbs, um, mm -hmm. lean proteins, lots of salads. And I'm not saying we it's carb free, but I try to like make it like, you know, two or three salads. And sometimes, you know, depending on how many dietary requests I have, sometimes I'll do at least one or two decomposed salads so people can kind of build their own and avoid, you know, the nuts or whatever they're trying to avoid. Um, lean proteins, um, not real heavy, heavy sauces. Cause I find if you do kind of carb load and heavy sauces, mm -hmm. people are just asleep. They're going to crash. Exactly. Nancy yeah. Sutter, Sutter Burns just piped in here. No more danishes, but you have to keep the giant chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I'm with you, Nancy. <laughs> I totally agree. Because, you know, you just spend a little more time on the treadmill in the morning if you have that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's all about choices, right? I think that's one mm -hmm. thing I've certainly learned. Choices, behavior, habits. Um, obviously, as meetings professionals for our attendees, we want to be able to provide them, e you know, the ease of a platform to make the good choices. But, right. you know, jumbo chocolate chip cookie now and again. Oh, hurt. hey, I, I just have to sh do a shout out. I stopped at this bakery on the gluten-free bakery, dedicated gluten-free, not free bakery here in Columbus. Nice. Um, and I, I, I'm going to, I just, oops, how do I do that? So, oh, yeah, Yum. blueberry muffins. I'm going to be here for a couple of days, so I'm not going to eat this all in one sitting, people. But um, I loved it. I mean, and no nuts, yeah. no no gluten no um dyes either so yes. um and i so a friend of mine recommended it but yeah i mean and uh, again i'm not going to eat it all in one sitting but i want to try it out because i think it's important you know hey you've got somebody your hotel can't do it hey go to this bakery right yeah, and absolutely. they've been around for 11 years wow yeah so. like i said our industry has come such a long way yeah. Um, and having gluten, you know, gluten free doesn't mean, you know, no bread. Like there's gluten free right. bread now. There's gluten free mm -hmm. pastries. There's, you know, there's Not so all of many. Good, yeah. Yeah. There's so many cool, um, cool options. We've really come a long right. way. That's awesome. Exactly. All right. So Nancy just put a question up here. Can we talk about break food versus meal selections too? Um, okay. Elaborate a little bit, Nancy, on what you mean by that. I mean, it is break food versus meal selections. It is hard because to me, it is you break break food is just they do those set breaks right, and then you've got the line items, the a la carte, which then jumps your budget like this high, right? Well, I was just gonna say, I think with breaks, you know, budget is you know, it's for me. I try to do as much stuff on consumption for breaks as possible, okay. you know, whole mm -hmm. fruit, and I like bagged 
snacks mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. some, you know, anything from like popcorn, pretzels, chips, trail mix. Um, I try to do a lot of stuff on consumption because I, at the end of the day, breaks can really add up. They can be almost more expensive than either your breakfast or lunch if you're not careful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. By the time you had coffee and, you know, everything else. And so I try to do as many of my breaks on consumption as possible just to offer a variety mm -hmm. and also kind of try to stick to some sort of budget if I can. Right. You know? Exactly. And Nancy just made a good point that the bagged food actually walks well. So, you yes, know, you're not juggling a plate and, you know, that big muffin. Yep. Um and, and she just, she's, I'm loving you being on this, Nancy, um, yes. consumption, no preset breaks. Cause they, a lot of that just gets not consumed. Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. so it does, it does add a little bit of challenge in, in that budget aspect, but I do think you said it earlier, getting in to talk to that chef saying, Hey, yeah. here's my budget. What can right. you do with this? Yes. Right. I, yeah. I think that's such an important point, Tracy, because I do think a lot of people approach food and beverage and they kind of keep their budget like in their back mm -hmm. pocket. It's like, no, tell the chef what you want to spend. Because the mm -hmm. other thing is they can rob Peter to pay Paul. Right. So they can they may say you can say to them, I have I have one day of meals and I, I have one hundred and fifty dollars to spend. What's the best way mm -hmm. to do that? And he can come up with some really creative right. ideas. You know, yeah. nobody knows their food costs, budgets and all that better than a chef. So right. I think being transparent with our budgets, if you really need to stay on a budget and we do, right? I mean, right. I don't, there's very few events that you have where you're like, I can spend whatever I want. <laughs> like, right. That just doesn't exist. Right. So I think working with your chef and working to accommodate, um, they, they, I think they really welcome, mm -hmm. um, welcome the cost parameters so that they can come up with The other thing is let's face fact, who has time to go back and forth 25 times, you know, right. Be honest, you know, they don't have time. You don't have time. Everybody's oh, busy, no, yeah. right? So it mm -hmm. saves, it also saves a lot of time because right. he's not going to come up with this really lavish, elegant menu that you can't afford. Right. Right. That's so true. Cause I mean, just going, I mean, I remember an event in April and it's like, just to get the kosher meal, we had one person we were doing Passover, but yep. just the conversation to get the kosher caterer to do the meal. It was like, oh my gosh, please just yeah. make my head stop hurting. Right. <laughs> Yeah. And that's, you know, it's just, yeah. so again, it's all about communication. Right. It really is. Yeah. And, and as we see, and respect. Our, exactly. And our CSMs have a little limited amount of time because they're handling multiple events and, and how can we make it easier? But I think they also need to make it easier on the other side as well. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Working yeah. as that team. I like that. Yeah. We've, um, talked, we've talked a lot about the culinary side, but the conference mm -hmm. services managers, and I, I think, you know, I used to be one early okay. in my career, I was on the hotel huh. side and I, they are, they are such a critical partner mm -hmm. when you're working with a hotel. I mean, they're, they, that relationship, the trust, the responsiveness. So I want to just give a shout out to the great CSMs out there because they really are such an important part of, uh, of the success that we, we uh, experience mm -hmm. at our venues and places. Yeah. And we, I think we take them for granted because they are there. Their hotels open 365. Right. right. 24 right. hours. Yep. And they're there doing a lot more events than you and I probably do every year. Oh, yeah. And yeah. And they're yep. managing. They're that conduit between all of the different departments. So. Right. And, yeah. you know, when you know, when you're on site for an event, they're mm -hmm. very present. But meanwhile, mm -hmm. they're, they go back to their office and they're doing banquet event orders for an event, mm -hmm. you know, two or three weeks from now. And, right. they're, you know, I think you and I are professional meeting planners, but they're also dealing with, you know, especially post COVID, there's a lot more kind of meeting planners that people are just getting handed meetings to do that may not have the experience. So that's a mm -hmm. lot of pressure on the CSM yep. to kind of help guide them and kind of, they have to kind of stop and say, all right, let's pick menus and, you know, they, right. they have to, they're not, not all the people they're dealing with are professional planners. And so that takes more yeah. time for them too. So they yeah. really are doing, coming out of COVID, I think that's been one um, job that has been really in high demand and very short staffed. And that's, that's, yeah. that's a tough job to be short staffed because it's, it's long hours and long days. Yeah. And I've talked to a couple of caterers, not CSMs, but the caterers who are getting yeah. calls from people who've never done an event before and they have no idea. And they're like, they'll ask them dietary needs. What do you mean dietary needs? Right. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. they're taking this new role of education and they don't have, unfortunately have the time to do that education, right. but it's right. also imperative that they do it at the same time. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Um, Nancy had a comment in here. Um, the walk note was relatively expense. The people that take too many, especially with those with conservative travel um, agents. That's so, a really good point. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's true. You put out a mm -hmm. basket of, you know, chips. Some people may take two or three and bring them to the room or put them on exactly. the That's true, Nancy. That's a really good point. Or they don't know that that soda is costing us $7 and 25 cents versus the right. dollar 25 in the, you know, in the, what do you call those vending machine? Right. Right. Yeah. Well, I don't even know if there's a, it's a dollar twenty five anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Probably I not. I bought two bottles of water yesterday at the airport. It was like seven dollars. I'm like, wow. Yeah. But. No, it's ridiculous. Nancy just said six dollars for a bag of popcorn. Mm. Yeah. Yep. 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 And it's and it's coming from a variety of different ways. It's not coming from the necessarily from the popcorn grower, the corn grower, right? right? It's coming no. from the manufacturer, and and I think that just kind of bringing that up too is. Um, what can you get local, right? Working right. with the chefs to see what you can get yeah. sourced locally and to help reduce some of those costs. Um, yeah. and, support, then, and support the small businesses, you know, that's exactly. so important. And I think, yeah. you know, that's another thing that you do see um, quite a bit with the culinary teams, especially like in the resort areas. I find mm -hmm. when I'm working, you know, at a lovely resort, they really do try to kind of take advantage of the farms and the, mm -hmm. you know, Yep. farmers and the pr people who are in close proximity to them. I mean, it's such a win-win. You're getting fresh, clean, fabulous food um, mm -hmm. and you're supporting a small business. So I know, you know, I, I love that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I do too. It's great. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah. Um, okay. So, and, and Nancy, we, I'm not going to bring up soda because soda is just, oh my gosh, bane of our existence, the pricing of it and how we, how many people take how much they drink. But yeah. so I want, I want to ask you a question. What is when you, when you think about the podcast and it's eating at a meeting, safe, sustainable, and inclusive, when you put those three things together or take them separately, what does that mean to you as a meeting planner? I think it's our kind of duty and responsibility to ensure that our attendees have a really great experience and that they mm -hmm. feel like they belong um, that they're included, that they can sit down to a table and have a meal, you know, enjoy a meal and enjoy the human connection. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really important. I think, you know, it's all at the end of the day, you know, it's so interesting because we get, I think we get caught up in our tasks mm -hmm. um, and, you know, our checklists, right? Checklist, yeah. right. But at the end of the day, it's like, you have to stop. You have to, instead of looking down, look up and say, how will this impact the attendee? Mm -hmm. You know, what is it? What's their perspective on this? What, you know, Let's think like an attendee, because I think, let's face it, as a planner, sometimes you get really frustrated. It's like, oh, God, they don't read anything. You know, I'm sending them 17 pages of logistics and they didn't read it. It's like, OK, the, this event is your focus. It's not theirs. They, they right. you know what I mean? So you have to kind of simplify, mm -hmm. prioritize your communication. Um, and I think, you know, when you're preparing a meal, you have to really think of your dietary and just think how, how will this experience be received by our attendees? I think, you know, let's work the culinary team, create a station that's going to be really cool. And yeah. I, I think the key is just making sure you always keep your attendees experience in mind. It's sometimes it's, you get, you get sidetracked, right. With your checklist. Right. So, yeah, no, that's a really good point. And, and I think that's come out a lot in our industry as well as like, and there are people who are really good. Let's do the logistics, but then there's also the strategy and then there's the yeah. experience thing. So how do you incorporate those three different aspects to make right. that great yeah, overall you, event? Yeah. Yeah. And I also think you need to kind of check with your stakeholder and say, you know, when this event is said and done, what do you want your attendees to walk away with? How do you mm -hmm. want them to feel? Mm -hmm. It's a good, really good question to ask because yeah. it's like that helps you to kind of design your event, your menus, everything mm -hmm. to kind of align with what that vision is. It's really important. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And it's because then they're going to value you more. And especially, you know, in, in a lot of the incentive trips, you know, they've, I've said this before is they've busted their butt to make, yeah. to win their, win the slot in this incentive trip. And then they get there and they can't eat or they can't do something okay. because it wasn't thought of. And then how does that make them feel? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think, too, you have to remember, especially on like an incentive trip, like you wouldn't have a job if it weren't for their performance and their you know, then excelling at what they do, you know. And even if it's not an incentive trip, I think it's our duty to make sure all attendees walk away from it. And, you know, that in-person experience feeling really good because it, it, 
it reflects on everything, how they feel right. about the company, how they feel about the event, how, you know, what kind of business they're going to do with this company moving forward. I mean, you have to look at it that way. It's, it is, it's a big part of, you know, delivering and marketing, you know, the company. It's, mm -hmm. it's huge. So you have to really kind of make sure you keep that in mind. Oh, that's a really good point. And I hope everybody takes some, that's really, thank you, Jennifer. That's, that's a great way to end this episode because I really do think that's the end of it. And we're not throwing an event just to have an event. So right. thank you. For exactly. That. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I so appreciate you being on here and um, giving us your ins and outs of what a, what, what's my banner say, the importance of a shared meal at events. And so thank you so much for that. And thank you for creating that for your attendees. Well, thank you, Tracy. And thanks for all you do for our industry. Truly an honor and delight to be here with you today. And um, thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm super grateful for it. Oh, you're welcome. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, everybody, we are here every single Wednesday. And actually, this is the first day I'm broadcasting to my face, my personal Facebook feed. So anybody who watched from there, welcome. Um, and every Wednesday at 12 o'clock, Next week, I've got Todd, um, who caterer chef Todd, who's going to be on and talking about um, what the ins and outs of catering um, are for us. So that will be really, he's really animated. So I'm very excited um, to have him on the show. And so next week, 12 o'clock right here, same place, same bat channel, right? Um, and until then, stay safe and eat well. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>